Andrew's jersey was soaked in blood. A lot of it. The wounds were small, but many. Seven punctures to the gut. He said it didn't hurt, but we were both in shock. Nothing hurt. We, didn't, we felt fear and panic, but we didn't feel pain. I was comfortable in South America. I loved the culture, the food, the music, the constant opportunity for adventure. I was adre an adrenaline junkie, and I loved cocaine. This, of course, led to years of stupid, reckless decisions that I eagerly romanticized as just a part of traveling, man. <laughs> Colombia is a great place to push it. Coke is four bucks a gram, and there is temptation and danger everywhere. Women, parties, thieves, cops, and, of course, football. My friend Noel and I were on our second trip to South America. We'd weathered robberies, revolutions, food poisoning, 40-hour bus rides, and a few football matches, big ones in Rio and Buenos Aires. We had a pattern of blowing through yellow lights. Jump, and the net will appear. The upcoming match between Independiente Medellin and Atletico Nacional was the talk of Medellin. The teams shared a city, a stadium, and a rivalry. The wealthy backed Independiente Med Medellin, while the poor rooted for Atletico Nacional. This was class war. The locals that worked at our hostel said that if we must go, to at least buy tickets in the tourist section. We recruited our travel buddy, Andrew, a laid-back Canadian we'd met a few weeks before, and set out with flasks full of booze and heads full of cocaine, wearing Atletico Nacional jerseys, ready to party. The entrance to the tourist gate was a safe distance from the main gate. We were herded in with a group of gringos and their tour guides and their translators. This was the kids' table. I wanted to sit with the grown-ups. From our posh seats, we had a great view of the sections behind the goaltenders. They were pulsating masses. Red blue horns, green beat drums, 30,000 warriors chanting battle. As the game started, the crowd erupted, the stadium shook, and the police in full riot gear had to shield any player making a corner kick from getting pelted with bottles and rocks. I wanted in. We had to watch the second half from the Atletico Nacional side. Noel and Andrew were on board. We're wearing their jerseys. We speak Spanish. We'll be fine. We're big kids. <laughs> the security guard's face, as we tried to enter the local section, said, Hey, you won't be fine. <laughs> he didn't want to let us in, but a little cash changed his mind. He warned us the gates would be closed until the game's over. No one else in or out. It took about 20 seconds for me to get scared. As soon as we walked in, the stairs started. We were the only gringos there, and the jerseys did not make us one of them. Everything about the scene spoke of violence on the brink. The crowd was almost all young, working-class men drinking Agua Diente, Colombian moonshine. We found a spot and watched the chaos. Each railing in the section shook with the weight of over ten men, arms linked, jumping up and down, singing war songs. No margin for error. One slip or misstep would meet a fall onto the concrete fifteen feet below. No sooner had I thought that than the floor shook with a thud and a crunching, popping sound. One of the guys jumping on the railing above us had fallen, and no one batted an eye. The songs continued as his body twitched. Noel, Andrew, and I looked at the kitty table with longing. Shit. We tried to watch the game and the crowd from as far away as possible. There were no full-on fights, but the air was stretched tight. As the seconds to an Atletico Nacional victory ticked down, the crowd turned toward the exits. I realized this was the moment they were here for. This was not about the game. No one walked out of the stadium. Well-dressed men ran with young sons on their shoulders and panic in their eyes. I was torn between wanting to get the fuck out of there and an innate curiosity to watch it all unfold. The choice was made for me by a handful of drunk locals who put their arms around Noel, Andrew, and myself. 
They were wearing Nacional jerseys like us. I, I thought they wanted to celebrate. I was corrected by a punch to the stomach. Riots are like wildfires. They spread fast. Time lost meaning, and every ounce of my energy went into keeping these animals off of me. I'd escape one only to be grabbed by two more. I finally got loose long enough to see what was going on. Noel had also freed himself, but Andrew was in trouble. He had six guys trying to take him down. I'm embarrassed to say that we stood there long enough for Andrew to have to call out for help. I knew that I couldn't leave him, but jumping back into that seemed like suicide. There was no option. Noel and I dove back in, pulling enough guys off of Andrew to free him. We ran as fast as we could as chaos climaxed all around us. I had Andrew in my sight, but no idea where Noel was. The road was so close. There were taxis, buses, a way out. Halfway to the road, they got Andrew again. He was tackled by a group of four. I ran over and heard him yell, Run! Run! They stabbed me! He broke free, and we were off and running again. It was pure adrenaline that got us out of there and into the back of the taxi. Andrew's jersey was soaked in blood. A lot of it. The wounds didn't look deep, but there was so much blood. I saw why they stayed after him and why he wouldn't give up. His digital camera bulged through his front pocket. It was one thing to be robbed of money and credit cards. Even a passport could be replaced. Andrew had four months of travel photos that hadn't been backed up on that camera, and he fought to keep them. I had no idea where Noel was or what the hell to do now, but I felt like I had to take charge, considering Andrew's state. The taxi driver wanted to take us to the hospital. Andrew insisted on going to the hostel. We got back, and I did what any fearless leader would do in times of stress. I opened two beers, handed one to Andrew, and freaked out. What do you want to do? What do you want to do? What do you want to do? Dude, what do you want to do? Everyone in the hostel told us to go to the hospital. Andrew sat there like an action hero, drinking his beer like nothing had happened. <laughs> he insisted he didn't feel a thing. Okay, then where's Noel? We have to find Noel. His absence was starting to make me sick. I thought I'd have to call his parents to tell them that their son was last seen in the middle of a riot that I ran away from. We were about to head to the emergency room when Noel pulled up in a taxi with a few other kids from the hostel he'd run into in the wake of the riot. He'd stayed, looking for us, pleading with the police to go in and look for his friends. As far as he knew, we were still caught in it. The cops literally laughed at him. They'd, make, they'd wait for the crowd to burn itself out, then go in and make arrests. They weren't going to stop anything. We took Andrew to the public hospital and found a staff that didn't share our concern. One look at the waiting room showed why. This wasn't an American emergency room full of people with symptoms that could wait. These people were fucked up. It was the closest hospital to the stadium. Head wounds, broken bones, bloody footprints tracked on the floor, and the cries of a woman who was going to give birth any minute showed us where we lie on the priority scale. Four hours later, we weren't any closer to seeing a doctor, and Andrew gave up. The shock and adrenaline had completely worn off, and he still felt no pain. We went back to the hostel, and one of the backpackers who had experience as a medic in the Israeli army had a look at him. He said that none of the wounds looked deep enough to be of great concern, but that he should still see a doctor. Belly wounds could be deceiving. Of course, we never did. Andrew settled comfortably into his role of, as the talk of the hostel, we went paragliding to celebrate our close call <laughs> and retold the story over countless beers. Noel and I never went to another game together, but we've been to a few third world hospitals since. Andrew's fine. He uses the story and the scars as a convenient way to show off his abs. <laughs>